Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. We are currently playing through April's exceptional story, Go Tell the King of Cats. At the end of the last episode we stepped through a mirror into the Parabola and we are currently standing in the Glimmerwood. A curtain of white smoke, like mist, hangs over a narrow wood. It is dark, barely alleviated by the dim colours shimmer under the canopy as though the forest had swallowed a gloomy rainbow. This is the Glimmerwood, the burnished champion calls over her shoulder, already striding toward the fringe. Keep to the lights, the darkness is an artifice of our enemy. The temple is on our far side of the wood, in a territory we lost after the war. Hurry now, and remember, we are in Parabola. Be wary. Okay, so we have a few choices here. We can give the Burnished Champion the Bandit Prince petition. I can keep it safe. I am, after all, his general in Parabola. I may even be able to enact any requests contained therein. Watches you closely. We can read it ourselves. He asked you not to, but how else are you going to know what it says? Or we can do neither of these things. Keep to the fringes of the wood. Darkness swathes the edges of the forest in concealing shadow. We can walk towards the middle of the wood. Deep red, purple, and silver lights shimmer at the heart of the Glimmerwood. Hmm, we spend an awful lot of time in the Glimmerwood, don't we? Okay. Big question is, do we keep it for ourselves? Do we read it? I don't trust him. Let's read it. The turbulent tabby sees what you are about. Eager to show up his tigerish kin, he goes to distract the herald. Is it true, he asks innocently, that tigers are really just reflections of cats, waiting one day to be returned to their true state of grace? The ensuing argument and references to the fall of cats, the rebel felines and the great hunt is explosive. You seize your moment. The petition is terse. The orts have my champion. I cannot abide this silicrum. But I do not have enough proof to remove her, not without an outcry from all loyal tigers. Rid me of this false champion. Ooh, she's a nasty lady, apparently. So now the big question is, do we keep to the fringes of the wood, or do we walk towards the middle of the wood? Hmm. Let's, let's start off easy and keep to the fringes of the wood. The three of you stalk your way through the shadowy gloom. Branches bereft of leaves crunch underfoot. Iridescent birds fly overhead. The tabby chatters at them ineffectually. The champion keeps close to you and speaks softly. We guard the wood, but the intrusion of the orts keeps us from ever taking it back. He pauses, her long tail swishing back and forth. Wait here. She lopes away ahead. A crimson light glints off swift, moving scales, concealed by shadowed undergrowth. And then the champion is back. You press on. You have to move through the deep wood now. Colours flit through the woods around like figures moving on the other side of stained glass windows. Ahead, the path forks, to the left a dim silver mire, and to the right a glowing scarlet marsh. The champion is inclined to move through the marsh. Let's go through the silvered mire. This vine-clogged mire is all that remains. Silver shrines, faintly in its depth like a drowned moon. I figure if the champion is not a very nice person and she's a false champion, we should do not do what she says. The burnished champion protests your choice of path, but does not try to stop you. It grows darker. The bleak rainbow lights of the wood are absent here. A pool of silver water shivers in the Glimmerwood's gloom. The water is deep to your thighs. A tabby rides on your shoulders. Your thighs ache and chafe as you wade deeper. He thinks it's a shame about your boots. As you wade through, the champion tells you of the tribute that once was mined and crafted into fabulous ornaments. Crowns and scepters, 
to be gifted to the orcs in times of truce. All were lies. The forest slopes on through a deep and foul marsh. This is the only way, the champion says, hefting her musket. There is much buried in its depths. Come on. We can follow the wisp ways. The wood descends into a smoggy bog, ill lit by flickering marsh lights. The burnished champion forges ahead, her musket at her hip, where her paw rests uneasily. The tabby rides on your shoulders as you splash through the marshes. Below the surface of the brackish water, you can make out clusters of old stone columns. You trip over a broken mosaic which depicts a large cat hunting a smaller, two-limbed figure. We had the amphitheatres pulled down, the champion says, after the disgrace of our cousins. As you press on, you hear a gentle hiss from somewhere in the trees on the far side. Your progress is watched. We are nearing the temple though, but I reckon the, uh, the snakes are going to try and stop us before we get there. The forest parts ahead. The land hurtles precariously towards a cleft in the ground. A slim, white marble stair rings the precipice, descending into the depths. This is the king's house. His temple of felicitations, the burnished champion says. Go! Be welcome, I can go no further. Hmm, okay, let's confront the uh, burnished champion. You know the bandit prince's suspicions. We may as well find out if it's true. The champion smirks. A low rumble begins in the base of her throat. A similar crumb. How naive. She lunges at you, throwing her musket to the ground. You duck and roll beneath the first swing of her thick arm. A paw. Claws extended, swipes at your face. You receive a heavy blow to the face, but you find your feet on her other side. You draw your weapon and strike at her back. She lets out a great roar. She howls as you strike again, a long, lonely lament. And then she bursts. Dead, rotting snakes spatter across the ground like rain, bursting as they land. An empty tiger skin Holes for eyes, crumples up on the ground. The champion is no more. You scramble to your feet and make for the stairs. The turbulent tabby is ahead. She was the snake all along. At least we did the king a favour, or the prince, I guess. The Temple of Felicitations. You reach the bottom of the steps. Smoke rises from the ravine. It smells of frankincense and attar. Great red plumes burst from broken earth. You pass through them to find a facade of a great temple. It is carved with colossal feline statues, standing sentinel on the facade. The turbulent tabby pauses to gaze up at his ancient fellows, before reluctantly pulling himself away and entering through the open, beaten bronze gates of the temple. If the King of Cats resides anywhere, it's here. The temple interior is weathered and broken. Holes in the high ceiling let in shafts of light that shine on gold busts of cat and glass mosaics in marigold and emerald. But underfoot, the marble floors are cracked and creviced. Dusty archways yawn onto silent, empty chambers. The temple is riddled with absence. The turbulent tabby is unperturbed. He races on, small paws pattering over the marble. Tail a question mark barreling through ancient halls. At the end of the central corridor is a high arc, beyond which flickers a sickly golden light. Beyond the arch is a chamber filled with rich, golden light, like unspooled honey. The chamber is filled with staring cats, large and small. Azrian, Bengal, a simple moggy, they surround a great wicker throne, 
like candles arranged around an altar. Upon the throne sits a silent, unmoving cat. He is the size of a lion, but a cat in form. Tabby stripes across his heavy frame, and a pale crown sits upon his head. He beckons you forward. His eyes are weary with age, but his body appears strong. As we can approach the throne, the turbulent Tabby looks up at you. He seems nervous. The king's eyes do not move, though as you approach the throne, every cat watching in the throne room begins to purr in the exact same low pitch. The turbulent Tabby shuffles towards the king, its head down, its eyes fixed on the floor, its gait slow. A supplicant, it has been too long. The king's voice is whisper soft, like a wind blowing dust through a tomb. We did not know, the tabby manages, splayed low across the ground in a gesture of supplication to the larger cat. The others, no, we had stopped believing. Yes, you have forgotten, yet my halls have been open. If only you were not so afraid, so decadent in your city that has made you soft, to seek me out, I know what is in your heart. As the turbulent tabby makes a choked sound in its throat, the king of cats addresses you. There are preparations to be made, rituals that must be performed. We shall make him ready to receive our grace. These rituals are not for outsiders, however stalwart and true. The hospitality of my temple, however, is yours until the appointed hour. You are dismissed. Oh dear. We have to leave our poor tabby friend alone. Let's leave the throne room. Whatever happens next, it's for the eyes of cats alone. Temporarily dismissed, you return to the gloom-racked halls of the King of Cats. The temple is a labyrinth of halls and narrow chambers. Dark arcways gape onto broken rooms and ancient bridges under which green, vine-choked water flows. Mosaics depict cats, larger and striped, making war in Parabola. The temple is vast, and you do not know how much time you have. Time enough to explore a little, though, you'd wager. Hmm, so we could explore the temple, or we can try and watch what happens to the turbulent tabby. Hmm, I think we should leave them to it. Let's explore the temple. Will you ever be here again? Besides, a command from a king must carry some weight. You wander through dusty hallways and pick your way across shattered bridges. You keep an ear out for the King of Cats call, but hear nothing. Yet, you roam farther. Ancient mosaics de depict cats, not as they are now, but larger, wilder, more ferocious. Some carry hunting horns, others wear flayed pelts. They hunt small, pink things through lush, Parabolan verdants. The temple is almost empty. Dusty room on dusty room, broken urns and toppled statues. No one has been here in centuries, neither man nor cat. Something hisses somewhere close by. Ah, a snake. A soft hiss rises from the temple walls from somewhere deeper within the citadel, as though something was waking. Where can it be coming from? Let's investigate the persistent hissing. It has been growing ever since you entered the temple. Where is it coming from? Deep within the labyrinth of the temple, you find a single domed chamber. The dome has been cracked like an egg, allowing the sunlight to filter through. In the heart of the chamber is a monstrous coil of rotting snakeskin, the size of a great cistern. There is something in its centre, small and white. Tentatively, you push through the outer coils, shifting the dead snake out of the way to uncover the skeleton of a small cat, no more than a runt. It wears a battered crown. The sickly light of the temple grows. It is not as it is 
was. You see motives of serpents on the walls, along with the cats, as though the scales have fallen from your eyes. Hmm. They killed the king of cats, and now they're pretending to be the king of cats? Definitely says there's a, a skeleton of a small cat no more than a runt, and it wears a battered crown. Now we're seeing motives of serpents on the walls. Hmm, let's see where this is going. There is something wrong. The temple is filled with motives of snakes and cats entwined. Whatever this place is, it is not as it had seemed. A bell tolls. It is time. The king has summoned you. But on returning, the light has faded from the throne room, where the turbulent Tappy waits for his wish to be granted. The throne room does not look as it did before. The turbulent Tappy is in there with whoever, whatever, the King of Cats is. The glamour of the King has fallen away. You see him for what he is, a hollow statue placed upon a throne. His stone lips do not move. A wind whistles through them, whispering. The cats around him are shells, hollowed out, empty skins, dried and stiff. Something, however, watches from within their empty eyes. The change does not appear to have affected the tabby, who gazes on the king as reverently as before. The king's blank eyes look down upon you, as though waiting for you or the tabby to speak. Whatever he is, he might be able to answer your questions. Wind whispers through the king's mouth. Promises and beguilements, offerings and dreams. It is a great confusion of hissed voices, as though whatever speaks is trying to find the best way to move you. As you approach the throne, a different voice, one of stone, sounds out. Enough! The whispers fall silent as the stone voice echoes around the empty hall. Speak, petitioner, the king of cats says. Hopefully we can do all of these things. Ask the king what it is. It is a statue, not a real cat. It resides in a temple where serpents are permitted. I'm a gift, the king says, its graven voice like a knife on stone. I am all that remains of a bargain between a lonely, lost creature who wished to be the greatest of his number, and the kings of the dreamland. Around the dead cat husks chatter as though echoing the story of their lord and master. They wanted to make a king to add to their number, and the cats wished for a sovereign in times of confusion. After the fall, this body it was delivered to them, and accepted for a time. But my promises... King's voice rattles away like a gravel blown across stone flags. The cats knew. My children, I had learned from them what I ought to be, but too late. Let's ask the king about his gifts. Are all its promises lies? Damn these nightmares. <laughs> the king is silent for so long that you wonder if it could ever have spoken. And still suddenly its stone voice sounds out. I give my gifts as generously as I can, according to the arts which made me. The laws which are not laws allow. I never mean harm. I fulfill my bargains to the letter. The king pauses. But my intent and what is permitted do not always agree. Though in the case of your tabby, I can give him what he wants. It is not an uncommon wish. Over the centuries, he can be made anew, though not as he, as he was. The whispers return stronger than before. When the king next speaks, he is almost drowned out. That is always a price. Okay, let's ask the king about the burnished champion. What was the nature of their relationship? Damn these nightmares! The king sighs as the whispers grow around him and through him. She came to me long ago, 
she asked that she be given the power to supplant her consort, the banded prince. I gave it to her. The husk cats begin to mule as one. The Lords of Dream found her useful, I believe. Not all my gifts are kind, though I wonder if her intent poisoned it regardless. Okay, let's conclude the questioning. You have heard all you need. At the tabby wraps himself around your legs. Is it my turn now? He quivers as though with anticipation or fear. Okay, we've read that bit. Let's not read that again. Consult the turbulent tabby. He's come so far to regain his mirror form. Does he still want this? While the turbulent tabby considers the sightless eyes of the king and his courtiers are firmly fixed upon him, against this backdrop, tabby's age is obvious. He is so grey, so small, so bony. I've wanted this for so long, the tabby says. It's been the wanting that's kept me going this far. I can barely remember who I was before. I wanted to be different than I am now. For things to have been other than they are. That I had been better than I was. He looks at you. His rheumy eyes wet. If I change, I fear I would return to being worse than I am now. Not knowing what I do now. The turbulent tabby seems to have made up his mind. But as his gaze turns to the silent king, he falters. I do not know. He says quietly. I feel regrets now. I don't like them. What if I feel more? He looks up at you. I can see what you can, he says, his voice taut with fear. But even so, he has the power, surely. So we have two options here. We can encourage the turbulent tabby to accept the gift. The king of cats is not what he had hoped, but the tabby's wish might still be possible. Or we can encourage the turbulent tabby to reject the gift. You should not accept the gift of the king of cats, regardless of the king's power. That's quite a big decision, but I think it's quite an easy one for me. I think uh, we will encourage him not to take the gift. Because like he says, it, fixing a problem by just forgetting the previous stuff is not how you fix the problem. Like he says, you could come back worse. Damn these nightmares! <laughs> the turbulent tabby turns to meet the king of cats' empty eyes. Then, the tabby fluffs up his tail and walks away from the throne, displaying his bottom to the king. Smoke begins to pour, hissing from the king's hollow eyes. His court of empty husks, cats, unhinge their jaws in one unified motion. From each empty, hollowed out cat skin, a caterwaul begins. The discordant music echoes around the throne room. The turbulent tabby leaps into your arms. The yowling of the husk cat dies away. The throne room is silent once more. I am able to grant one further gift, a privilege accorded to all cats who stand before me and requested it. The king's voice is like tefeta upon a whetstone. As he turns his attention to you, I do not have the power I once had. I can only grant that one gift. Its voice is distant, as though waning. Alas, my gifts are only for cats. While you have some admirably feline qualities, you are no cat. But you may ask on behalf of another. I think I am going to do the ship's cat petition. Because we, we're not going to do it. We've already killed the... Uh... Then again, I don't, ah, I don't trust him. And surely the children are better with the cat. With the mum. Than some random snake cat king. I think I'm going to ask for nothing, you know. You do not trust anything coming from this king. The glassy eyes of the husk cats watch you from the shadows. The king's stone face is inscrutable. Silence drags on. At last, 
the king speaks in its voice of stone. Far be it from a king to impose charity where it is unwelcome. Far be it from a two legs to recognize greatness when it's in its presence. Never forget, once we hunted you. The day will come when we shall again. But now your time here is done, two-legged one. At least you aided one greater than yourself. Before your ingratitude got the better of you. We are done with you. Now wake. The cat husks begin to scream as though pierced with red hot pokers. The king's eyes burst into amber flame. The throne room shimmers like a hot day and dissipates. You wake in your lodgings, alone. The tabby is nowhere to be found. Home again, your lodgings are quiet. The clock on the mantelpiece sounds, the noise of the fire in the hearth crackles and roars. Everywhere you turn, you find clumps of shed fur. But of course the turbulent tabby is not here, yet where could he be? There is a knock at your door, waking you from your reverie. Let's answer the door. Perhaps it's the tabby. Perhaps it's your neighbour with the tabby. Perhaps it is merely the post. The postman hands you your mail. Bills, missives from unwanted acquaintances for unpromising evenings, more bills, unsolicited calling cards, and an invitation from the Duchess. It is an invitation to her salon, dated immediately. She has news, she says. The Duchess private secretary is waiting for you. His manner is frosty as he opens the door to her inner rooms, but makes no comment. The Duchess rises from her couch as you enter. Good, she says. She looks tired. Her eyes are red. There are letters. She indicates a selection, fanned out on a silver tray on a table. They came to me, but they are meant for you. I am the only address most cats bother to learn. Oh no. <laughs> the first letter is from the ship's cat on the Cleopatra's needle. It is terse. It has evidently been dictated to someone with an unskilled hand. He tells you that her kittens are well. She assumes you were not able to reach the King of Cats. It was only ever a distant hope. The captain means to adopt one of her kittens for his children. The other she will raise and train herself to replace her on her retirement. That's not so bad. The second letter is from the banded prince. The prince thanks you profusely for your service in ridding his old ally, consort and enemy from him, without incurring the wrath of her supporters in the court. He does not wish to know the particulars of the encounter, only that she did not return. He will have her name stripped from all of his palaces and histories, as though it never was. The Duchess gives you the briefest of smiles. She says nothing, watching you as though waiting to see what you do. Let's ask about the turbulent tabby. Surely that is why the Duchess summoned you. This will bring the story to a close. You return to us. Go and see him. She gestures to a door behind her. He doesn't meet your eyes. Soft blankets and toys litter the floor of the small room. Plates of rich meat sit on a silver tray. Amidst the mess, the turbulent tabby dozes. His fur is greyer, his breathing wheezy. As you approach, he slowly lifts his head. A welcoming rumble begins deep within his throat. I knew you'd find me, he says. I'm glad that you did. I don't have much time. I wanted to say, I wanted to thank you for showing me that all that a cat could be, whilst I still had time. His great paw finds your hand. You stay for a while, his warm paw in your hand until he drifts off again. The Duchess tells you that the tabby has requested that the kittens of her salon be allowed to visit him. He has so much he wants to teach them. He has also put aside some things for you, she says. Mementos of your travels together. She arranged their delivery to you for him. 
the Duchess shows herself out. You've been a good friend to him. He's not, she says with a sad, though fron smile. The cat he was. Turbin and Tabby chose to spend the last days in comfort, surrounded by kittens and imparting what wisdom he could. And we got a mountain shirt. And we have a portrait of the tabby in repose. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm going to miss that cat. Really enjoyed that story there. But that is the end of the exceptional story. Thank you very much for watching. If you did any of the other options, please let me know what happened. And as always, see you next time.